welcome back. Amen. I thank you for Brother Susan for the song service. And uh, let us uh, pray again. Father in heaven, thank you so much for bringing us here once again this Sabbath afternoon. And we ask, Lord, that you may please continue to bless us with your presence and uh, teach us once more the things that are important for our salvation this afternoon. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Well, um, what did you think about, uh, this is going to be a discussion, so it's not going to be me talking all the time, so we're going to kind of try to make it more interactive. Um, what do you think about this afternoon, uh, this today's more, uh, uh, message? Hmm? About this rebel, what do you think about that? Anybody? It was prophesied. Yeah. Sorry, go ahead. We were told it would happen and it's happening. Okay. It's kind of uh, you know, bittersweet in a sense yes. that you know, we we're told it was going to happen. You see it happening, it's still sad to see. <clears throat> but at the same time, you realize that it's, you know, we're closer to the end. Right. So there's some bittersweetness to it, uh, but it's still sad to see. Yes, sir. Uh, What's so sad is there's a lot of this going on around not only the country but the world. All this stuff is going on, and it's sad to see. Cause I, 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 I saw it, and I was like, "This can't be a seventy events church rock concert, seventy events." Mm -hmm. I just could I was shocked. Okay. So that's why Jesus has to come, and, and, and he's gonna do what he got to do. This strange act, right? Yeah, you see, if, if anything, everything that starts in the United States eventually spreads to the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. Whether we like it or not, that's just the fact of life. Yeah. So, and that's why the mark of the beast is going to start here in the United States and then spread to the rest of the world. So God has allowed or raised this country kind of like to the top and everything trickles down from there to the rest of the world. What are some of your experiences with apostasy in the SDA church? <laughs> Things that you have personally experienced or observed, not on YouTube, but your personal experience. Uh, it's like transcendental meditation type of thing. Where is that? Uh, Where was that? When? Where? Where did you experience that? One of our sister churches. Yeah. Okay. You know, I mean, you know, I, I, first I was oblivious to it. Then I said, wait a minute, this ain't right. Mm -hmm. And a certain person brought it into the church. Uh -huh. And then other people could caught hold of it. I said, this stuff is crazy. How is it, it, it happening? First they tell you to just relax. Mm -hmm. Take everything out of your mind. Right. Well, you know what that happens. You know what happens there. Mm -hmm. The devil comes in. And... I just, because they were friends of mine, so I'm thinking, okay, it's cool. But I said, this ain't right. You don't just empty your mind. You want to fill your mind with the Holy Spirit. The Word of God. But uh, when, I thought, when I thought about it, I just, I, I kind of woke up out of it and said, no, no, this ain't right. I said, right. And it's, it's more of that stuff going on. And speaking in tongues. With the, in the Adventist church? In the Adventist church. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. That's not, that's common now. That's common. I heard it firsthand. Twice. Firsthand. High officials. Yes. I'm asking for a great tell. Right. Uh, high officials. It's here. <laughs> no, it wasn't here. <laughs> the building would catch a fire and start people speaking in tongues. <laughs> we down. have it at West Side, right? <laughs> <laughs> we got um, we, I think we are in the of the artists. We call certain Adventist artists mm -hmm. that when well, last year they've been putting in like brought it out of the books because they've been having girls all over the places. 
What? They were, yeah, they were living like artists in the world. Mm. They, were having, they were married and they were having girlfriend here and girlfriend over there and mm. girlfriend over there and living with this one, living with that one. Like it was... The know, world. Yeah. <laughs> they were living the life on, of an artist. Wow. Of a normal artist. And we got pastors also that they just being, being yeah. normal human beings, living with people they like marry and then go remarry families and stuff right. like that. And they are officials. <coughs> yeah, Sister Veronica. I had a pastor uh, make a very, very crude uh, pass at me, very crude. And she didn't want me to say nothing. <laughs> I was ready to go ballistic. Well, because of who it was, it would have been ugly. And it would have just ran through all the churches like a grapevine and I'd have been vague. Yeah, okay? Yeah. So some things ain't working for it that you got to pick your battles. So, but then I found out that several women in that congregation had experienced the same thing with this pastor. And a couple of the ladies had left that congregation because of it and went to another church. And um, yeah, pretty bad. I mean, because the, the, the things that were suggested, I could, yeah, that was just wrong. And I could see that going through the church and that's just gross. I, I saw recently where um, they had ordained this female lesbian pastor in an Adventist church. Her, yes. husband, her husband was a um, he was an elder, mm -hmm. and uh, they were calling on the uh, on the general conference to do something about it. And our friendly just sat there and said, "Well, there's nothing we can do." Mm -hmm. Yeah. So They're very open down in some of our southern churches. Uh, the church is full of in, in, they're in office elders. Not only they have female lesbian elders, right. which that's confusing. What what opened the door for the uh, homosexual mm -hmm. movement in the church was the ordination of women. In fact, that that's amazing because I think it was what what year was that? Two thousand fifteen. Yeah. The you see that the, 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 you, when you begin to see how a Jesuit mind, oh, the Jesuit mind is very very subtle. I mean, you know, it's, you, it's very strategic. You think he's going this way, but he's actually going the other way, right? So we had the uh, com general conference say no to women's ordination according to the bible right the very next day i think it was the next day elder ted wilson gets up and says nothing changes yeah. i mean one one person overrides overrules an entire general conference because that's not what the general conference said the general conference said no apparently it's the local conference that has the authority well, no, 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 but in the, as, as a, a church policy, as a church policy, the general conference rule that the, you know, so, but he came, he came up and said that the, he reinterpreted the decision. He didn't say it wasn't there, he reinterpreted it and said, well, uh, the, nothing changes. We'll just continue as we were. He gave a speech on that. So, Obviously, those that were ordaining may continue to ordain, right? So basically, what it, what it meant was the no decision became a yes because everybody now is ordaining. Well, I understand so, Mark Finley said with, with this particular situation that I just brought up, he said that it was the local conference who had the, you know, the authority. Yeah. Right. Yeah, no, no, I'm not, I'm not talking about that. I'm just saying generally the movement in the church. Yeah, yeah. The yeah. movement, the coming in of the movement of, because wherever you have that, all the church, it wasn't us. We didn't start it. It was started by other Sunday churches. I think the Methodists or some other church, uh, they started it. 
every time when they had that approved, it opened the door for the uh, LGBTQ to go in. So those are the uh, 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 the things that we have come across. So my, my, my question then is, the next question is, if you observe or witness apostasy, and there's no right or wrong answer here, we, we just sharing, right? So I'm not even, I don't even have the correct answers for some of these questions. But we're learning from each other. If you observe or witness apostasy in the church, what should you do? How? You can we love. It depends on the situation. It, it is, is, right. Yeah. Some folks, you just got to go straight in with, like, like I did. Yeah. And walk away. You know? Yeah. Uh, 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 brother, uh, 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 Pastor, I mean, I who have lived here, I think what Cuban said is, is important. Uh, you know, I understand the idea of rebuking, you know, we, we should rebuke when we need to. Uh, sometimes there's, there's ignorant apostasy, you know, folks just don't know. So you, you definitely have to uh, address it, uh, and, uh, and rebuke may not be necessary, uh, education may be necessary. In certain circumstances, a rebuke may be necessary if they know better, you know. But, so every situation may be different, but the point is it must be dealt with and confronted. We have to do that in love. Yeah. We have to do that uh, as wise, wisely, and not harshly, or you know. So again, it depends on the circumstance, how we, how, but it has to be addressed. But we, how we address it depends on the circumstances. Uh, Sister Wesley. So the word rebuke is what we think of sometimes. I think it's been used incorrectly by us sometimes when God talking about review it means that you state it is not correct but you don't sometimes when you review it's like an attack on people because of what they believe yeah it's not nice to be reviewed and that's that's not what God asking us to do okay. um, that's Satan ways but it's not God's way review is just stating the fact that this is incorrect you're not in agreement with it. Um, and so we have to know, when we're using rebuke, what are we saying? Um, because God cares for every soul. He said, while you were yet sinners, I died for you. And so we may not, be, they may be doing something that we're not doing because we all are sinners somewhat. So we may be doing something that may not be as far to the cross as we are and so we have a responsibility to bring light to this dark area where they are but how we do it we have to do it in salvation in mind not rebuke the way human being does it not you guilty you better you paying for that God do not ask us to um, when he comes, he will he will do what he needs to do. But until then, we have to go for saving the souls, not um, punishing. Hmm. So, would you say that uh, there's a time for rebuke? There's a time for education. I agree with that. Yep. And there's a time for just they don't for the person. They don't do that anymore. <laughs> but there used to be a time for censure. Mm -hmm. Remember what a censure? Yeah. And there was even used to be a time for disfellowship. Mm -hmm. yeah. Remember that? There used to be that, yep. yep. They do it. They still do it. Some churches do that. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Let me uh, share an experience that I had with, uh, this, was, this was so long ago, I guess I could mention names because they, the person is in good, I mean, was, is, if this is a positive story, so. This was back probably 2002, could be 2002, maybe 2003, so been a while back. And I had gone to a church, a sister church. In fact, Pastor Judy Crawford was a, was a very good friend of mine. I mean, he, she, was, she was a nice lady, he was one of the nicest nicest piece people that I knew. 
even though I didn't agree with uh, women's ordination and all, I, I, li I liked her and uh, I ended up actually going all the way and serving. With, oh, you were there, right? That's where I met you. Yeah. That's where we met, uh, yeah. Prophet and I, we met there. So how I, how I ended up moving there was because I was at Howville at the time. I was, oh, yeah. I was with uh, Logan. So, so I ended up kind of going back and forth because she kept trying to come on over, come on over. So I went there one time and I was sitting there and there was a Sabbath school. So, and this gentleman, from what I, I found out later, he was from California, I don't know his name, but he was very good. I mean, he was smooth. He was eloquent, he was smooth. And he was speaking powerfully about the, the topic was the Holy Spirit. And he was talking completely things that were outside the Bible. I mean, totally not in the Bible. And basically, I think it was like, I think it's the Jehovah's Witnesses. I think it was the Jehovah's Witness version of who the Holy Spirit is. And uh, so he went on and on and on about it's a force, it's not a person. It's like a, you know, like a electricity. You know, it's, yeah, that's how it, you know, it, it, it's, there's no intelligence in it. Wow. It's just a force that God uses, mm. kind oh, of, yeah, yeah. to, to yeah. do, you know. So some, something along those lines, I mean, I don't remember all the details, but it was something along those lines. So, I mean, there was, I couldn't take it anymore. Yeah, it came on. So I, I, I had to stand up without even being pointed out. And I stood up and, and said, wait, wait a minute, just hold on a sec. And then, but I think the Holy Spirit helped me because I was able to show from scripture. So what the scripture says, and, and, and then he could argue with that. Because if I say, I think you are wrong, this, this, and that gave you my opinion, so it will be a, a debate. Me versus him, yeah. right? But if I bring the verses and say, but look, look what this verse says, and this verse says, and this verse says, guess what? He's no longer arguing with me now. So it becomes, he, and I believe even at, at that point, remember when Jesus would argue with, uh, he would say things, uh, and the Pharisees would be silenced. Not that they, they loved uh, what he was saying. But they couldn't gain saying what he was saying. See what I mean? Because I think the, the Holy Spirit comes and gives you that authority. So that's how I, 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 I that was my experience of actually intervening. And that's when, after the sister, uh, Pastor Jude Crawford said, see, that's why you need to come here. And all that. And then, she, then I ended up moving there. Yeah. So I'm, I guess what I'm trying to say is if you use whenever you have in a situation like that be armed with scripture or spirit of prophecy don't go rebuking someone with your own opinion yeah. because then how do you know your opinion is correct right yeah, yeah. yeah. but if, even if they wanted to fight you but if you look this is what the bible says this is what the scripture of prophecy says it's not me but you know it's not personal at that point uh, I saw, okay, I saw one, two, then I'll, I'll step over there. Yeah, we had okay. an experience when we were members in uh, South Dakota, and uh, we drove an hour and a half one way to that church because it was actually doing pretty good, but then some things changed. They started bringing in some new pastors, uh, revolving door new pastors, and we were sitting in the congregation during Sabbath, and the pastor one day, he said, this may shock some of you. What, what, what do you think when you hear that? <laughs> this may shock right. some of you, and he said, Get ready to be shocked. He said, James and Ellen White were friends with some folks that were wife swapping. Wife swapping. You had that along with this may shock you. So, what's the implication? The implication is they're doing it. They're probably involved in wife swapping. Yep, yeah, exactly. Ooh. Then he put a, up on the screen, he put up a book. It's called New Nuts Among the Berries. But he didn't say it was a good book, didn't say it was a bad book. He just put up this book. And I'm suspicious, so I'm thinking, I wonder what this book's... What was the book saying? Time? New Nuts Among the Berries. <laughs> New Nuts Among the So we got home, I said to my wife, look it up on the internet, looked it up. I don't know how she did this, never done it since, but she, she accidentally bought the book. She pushed the wrong button, we, we bought the book for 10 bucks. So anyway, 
it came to us as paperback, and inside they were making uh, jokes of uh, James and Ellen White, anybody else that would be really. Right there. Oh yeah, he just put the book up there. He didn't say it was a good book. He didn't say it was a bad book. But why? Why did he put it up there then? Right. And then he ended with a song by Ray Bolts, um, which he had some songs that weren't too bad for a while, but. Then he came up with the song, left his wife and children, came up with the song, You Can't Tell Me Who to Love Anymore. He's open homosexual now. And it was played loud with the drums and everything. So I went to the pastor later and I said, where did you come up with this about James and Ellen White being friends with uh, people who are wife swapping? He says, well, it's in some of my books in storage. He says, I don't know where it's at. You just need to take my word on it. Yeah. I said, no, I don't think so. So then I got noticed that um, I was not, even though I was a personal ministry leader and an elder, the pastor said, you can't, you know, you're going to be uh, punished for two or three weeks, I forget, you can't come to church. Uh, <laughs> well, I said, at the conference, so, back. So you were banned from coming to church? I should have went anyway. My, I wanted to go, but one of the elders says, no, nah, just let them have their way for a bit, see what happens. Now I wish I would have just came and said, hey, I'm an elder, a personal ministry leader, you can't ban me from coming to church, that's be a church vote. Are you listening to this pastor? Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so, so anyway, a little while later, that, that pastor was pushed on to another church, and then they brought in another one, and uh, it was all coming from the same the same leadership. And the other, some of the others in the church were had some of the same problems with what was happening, but nobody would stand up. And some of them would get behind me and say, "Go get them, go get them," you know. But then they'd run whenever the conference would come. And so, yeah, what do you do? Well, we finally just left that church because they wanted me to sign a paper saying I would never walk out of a church again no matter what. <laughs> that ain't happening. That ain't happening. So we left. That's a seven-day Adventist church, right? Yeah. yeah. We left, and that's only part of it. That's enough dirt. But, but it was coming from the conference. They were bringing in these pastors that were promoting people like Rob Bell, a non-Adventist homosexual pastor, things like that. And I was the only one that would speak up. Other people didn't like it, some of them, but they wouldn't take the heat, so to speak. And you get that a lot. You get people who agree with you, and many times when push comes to shove, they're, you don't want to say anything. Come not that way. Yeah. yeah um, we had a situation in Maryland where um, we had just built a brand new Seventh-day Adventist church. And this pastor, they had signed it, they, they gave it to this young pastor who just came out of seminary. Well, he started teaching things, or say things that just didn't line up with the, our belief system. And then he wanted to turn the church into a community church. And the congregation, uh, they didn't like that, and uh, so we had to call in the conference, and that they got rid of him. Yeah. <laughs> well, at least the conference was on the, the yeah, church's side. Yeah. Yeah. When it goes the other way, exactly. it's not harder. I know, yeah. 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 I'm sorry. So? I, I'm not sure. What, what, what is wrong with the community church? I, mean, I don't know what he wanted to do, so can you give me a little bit? You he wanted to ch he wanted to and change the name it. of the church from a Seventh Adventist church to a community church with uh, with with uh, belief standards were not Seventh Adventist. Mm -hmm. Ecum ecumenical church. Yeah, ecumenical oh, church. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah, I think there's a lot of that going on. Actually, I saw. Actually, I think I I was going to say something about that, Emmanuel, but I had to check it out for okay. for time's sake. So, yeah, yeah, let's brought that up. Okay, so we see then uh, that God's mission for the Protestant churches of the 16th century, it was to clarify or to restore the truth, you know, which, uh, I mean, uh, to, to remove the misconceptions of God, which Satan had promoted through paganism, and the Roman Catholic Church. See, many people now, oftentimes, because people don't want to read, so when you say something that the Roman Catholic Church is not a Christian church, 
people think you are being judgmental. You are being, you are not being nice. But it's the truth because if you study, it's almost like okay, maybe we need a study of the Roman Catholic Church beliefs so that you can see that they are not, they are not, uh, uh, they are not Christian. They are not even, not, not, don't even talk about Seventh Day Adventists. I'm talking about Christian. Yeah, <coughs> and the reason why I some of them, I mean, might be a fact just out of pure ignorance. You remember when Constantine, they were pagan, but he took Christianity and he mixed it. Yep. So he made it, you know, Christianity impure. So, but you know, you go down generations, all they see is Christianity. They don't see the paganism. They see Christianity, so they believe the Christians. So, I mean, you do have to approach that a little carefully because in ignorance, that, that's what they believe. And they don't recognize the fact that uh, there's so much paganism weaved into their Christian beliefs that it's just a false religion. But uh, many, if not most Catholics, won't know that. They, they will believe that they're sincere and that they're sincerely Christian. So this is where you know education would take place. You gotta put the fault really at the, the leaders, the shepherds that know better and they know the history, they know that it's based on paganism. They know there's no basis in the scriptures for it. And even they see themselves, you know, for example about the Sabbath, that you know, Saturday is the Sabbath. And one of the propagations they say, listen, if you want to keep the Sabbath, if you want to keep the Sabbath, go talk to Seventh day Adventists. Yeah. <laughs> they, they said they, they keep the Sabbath, the seventh day. But we changed it. So if you if you want to keep our day, then you, you stay with us. Otherwise, you go talk to Seventh day Adventists. Right. They say that. That's right. But I'm just the point I'm making is that the people uh, don't know that. Most of them are ignorant. Right. So this is where you know education. Yeah. Uh, yeah. This this comes from uh, these uh, a certain structure, I believe it's like a circles. Actually, uh, I'm told, I read, there's a book that I read called uh, Operation Gladio. Some of you, I don't know if you've read that book. I think in there, there's Cecil John Rhodes. Ever heard of Cecil John Rhodes? He's the one who colonized many countries in Africa, including my country. In fact, the country where I come from was named Rhodesia, after Cecil John Rhodes. And you've got the Rhodes Scholarship, you know, Rhodes Scholarship. All that, my, all that Rhodes Scholarship is gold from Africa that, that you know, paid for, for all those scholarships. But in any case, Cecil John Rhodes invented, he was, you know, part of his secret societies to rule the world and dominate the world and all of that. And he came up with this system of circles, meaning that you have the inner core. If you're an inner circle, the term inner circle. So you have the inner circle, and then you have the outer ones, and the outer. So the inner circle are the ones, the most innermost circle are the ones who know what's going on, right? The real thing. And the outer ones know less and less and less. The outer ones, the perimeter ones, those are the ones that don't know anything. They, they actually think this is a Catholic church. I mean, this is a Christian church. They go there sincerely to that they are going there to worship God. They don't know what is going on. The things that we know, they don't know. They don't even know. We know more about Catholicism than most Catholics. Do you realize that? Yeah. So, uh, adding on to the point, what, what uh, uh, Gerald is saying that, you know, you gotta be, uh, pray for, Stacked so that you don't want to, you know, like when you, when I was young, we used to catch birds, and we would like lay traps and try to catch them and all of that. And there's the difficulty when you are little is you don't handle the birds carefully. If you catch them, you 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 hold them too tight and they die. See what I mean? So you don't want to catch your bird and then kill it. Right? You gotta be kind of gentle, hold your even very gently so that it doesn't die in your hand. That's kind of kind of thing you gotta do when you are dealing with people from all these other denominations. Because your goal is not to win uh, the argument. That's right. And you've already won by being belonging to Christ. But now your goal is to try to open a way into this person's heart where you can put the gospel in there. Sister.
Hey, that, that's, that's, that's a very good point too. Because, let me tell you a story. There's a, a man that was going around doing what we, we do here. In fact, we're going to do passing great controversy. And he ended up uh, uh, knocking at the door. I don't know if, I, if it's, I don't think it's the forerunner, but I know, I know the story. He knocked at this, uh, it was a bishop. And uh, he, he says, oh, these great controversy. Oh, you're a Seventh-day Adventist. Come on in. And he showed him all the Seventh-day Adventist books that he had. And he told him more things about Seventh-day Adventists than here. Said, Man, you know why? Because they also understand, especially, it's not everyone, because in, in Catholicism, they're specialists. You know, not everybody knows. Even the high priest, some of them might not know anything about Adventists, but there are some that are, whose specialty is this church, or whose specialty is this. So they would be, they, they study that thing, uh, uh, you know, as you say, more than we ourselves would study it. So, but here we're talking about, you know, trying to win those souls to come in. You're trying to open up, the, lift up the veil, lift up the eye. How do you do it without offending? You know, how do you do it without, because, like me, I wasn't a, a, a Seventh-day Adventist. Someone had to reach out to me without offending me, right? Someone had to find a way, and I mean, I could tell you, you know, I don't want to spend time on that, but do you see what I mean? So, how many of you here, let's see, how many are not, were not born in the Seventh-day Adventist Church? Catholic. Catholic, there you go, see? So that means someone had to reach out to you, right? Mm -hmm. Someone had to reach out to you. Yeah. you I mean, you, you didn't just wander and one day wake up and say, I'm going to a Seventh-day Adventist church. Mm -hmm. Right. So that's how that works. Yeah. Go ahead. Well, yeah, I mean, that's, you know, what I always say is, I always try to say that, uh, you know, you must always be close-minded about certain things. When it comes to God, you be close-minded about God. There's no other, like for, for instance, there's no other one. So if someone says, well, Jesus is the only one, but you know, maybe there could be another. No, please. Well, you know, it's, it's it's obvious that who's the number one enemy of the Catholic Church? So would you not monitor, if you were in a oh, war, yeah. would you not monitor carefully the enemy? Right. So they're monitoring the, us. Of course. The, the Catholic the, Church has the best intelligence you think this is services in the world. So, I mean, the, 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 the CIA is a junior to the Catholic Church. Yeah. They work for the, CIA, the, the Catholic Church. They communicate with the CIA. They work for them. You know, yeah. I mean, you know, yeah. I don't want to go into all of that, but I'm just saying. So, but anyway, let, let me go on. Let me go on here because this 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 is this is too interesting that I may I may get lost in the in the discussion. So that's why then you had great men like John Wycliffe, William Tyndale, John Knox, Martin Luther. They lived a spiritual torch of truth in the dark ages. Yet, we see that after these great reformers died, their followers did not continue to advance the doctrinal reformation. They stopped. That's why we have the Lutherans. After Luther died, they became Lutherans. Uh, is it Wycliffe? Uh, who's, who's the Methodist one? Wycliffe? Which one? Wesley. 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 Wesley, right. After he died, they became Methodists. Right? Yeah. Uh, who else? Calvin. The Baptists. Calvin. 
after they, they came up, they came up with some truth. It's almost, you have the truth. This is, the, people started here, yeah, the Roman Catholic Church, right? With all the, in the dark ages, having blinded everybody. Then came the Reformation, and then the truth would advance and stop. Advance and stop. Yeah, and advance. And then after that, you know, people would just stay there. And someone would come along and then take it further. And someone would come along and take it further. Until God decided, okay, 1844. What happened in 1844? It's called the what? The Great, the great Awakening, right? The Great Awakening, almost, it's almost like the whole truth just you know, God will open up the whole truth before the world. Right. So, interesting that uh, it, people like Ellen White, they were not even Seventh-day Adventists. They were... What? Uh, uh, Ellen White was Methodist, right? Methodist. She was Methodist. Methodist. And you know what's happened with that movement, largely? Mm -hmm. yeah. We've gone through the same cycle as all the other movements. That doesn't mean God's not going to use the seven down in his church, but we're, we're vulnerable to the same thing happening in our church that happened with the Wesleys, the Methodists, the Lutherans, the Calvin. Once the leader died, yep. stopped, largely stopped. Right. Yep. With the exception, I believe, yep. the exception is that we have an enemy. We, 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 you know, the great controversy is real. There's a battle a spiritual battle that is going on that is bigger than what's going on in Israel and Gaza. There's a spiritual battle, a real spiritual battle that's going on. And uh, you know that, who knows uh, Roger Mano? You all heard about Roger Mano? He said something, and I think you've all, you know all about it. He said something when he was in the worshiping the devils, the demons. He said that uh, he found out that they were, they were talking about how, you know, the whole world is deceived and the, the, this was their spiritual, they call them spiritual cancer. They have, past, they have pastors, these people, they have pastors that actually, they do services like we do. They even have Wednesday meetings, believe it or not, right? They have Wednesday prayer meetings. Interesting, we don't come to our own meeting. But you know, Satan has Wednesday prayer meetings for his churches, for his people. So they were going for these services and they do praise, and they give testimonies what the demons have done for them. And, and, they, and uh, it's called uh, positive feedback, whatever. So they, they do that. And so the, the, the spiritual, he calls it the spiritual counselor. He was telling them how they've basically have the whole world deceived and all of that. And then someone says, uh, well, what about the Adventists? You know, you, you say you've got all this under, and, but the Adventists don't be, you know, they're not yet deceived. They said, ah, you know, because the Seventh-day Adventists are so small in number, he, he kind of sort of forgot about them. But here was the, what he was saying. The Seventh-day Adventists are the people that the devil hates the most in the whole world. Did you get that? The Seventh-day Adventists are people that the devil hates the most in the whole world. And one of the things he said was that they cannot be deceived. The reason they cannot be deceived is because they keep the Sabbath. So because of the keep the Sabbath, they have a special help. And when they are under that hell, they are not ordinary people. I mean, I'm just quoting what you're saying. He says, they are not ordinary people. So it's almost like the, accepting the Sabbath truth opens you up to a whole world of truth. And that allows the Holy Spirit to protect you from lies. You can see lies coming from afar. You, you, that's why you sometimes you would how can a person be deceived? You know, there are people, I've seen some, uh, in Africa, there are churches where the pastor would say, go and eat grass. Mm. And the people will go and eat grass. 
and, and, and the people will drink bleach or whatever because they are under this spiritual stupor, deception. Yeah. What I'm saying is, when you're in that, you might look at that person and think, why are they so stupid? Why are they, why are they doing that? But you know why? It's because they do not have the spiritual help that you have. If I'm not mistaken, it was stated that the only way you're going to miss, lead them is to join them. You know what I mean? To infiltrate. Like the infiltrate. Yeah, that's the word. It's the infiltrate. Like uh, the Jesuits. Do they come in and, you know, however it takes, long it takes for them to get your trust. And then they sit in on board meetings and get in little group huddles and make suggestions and to get into your mind so uh, you can start thinking about the same thing, same thing, you know, uh, with the angels. You know what I'm saying? It's like, God, that's not fair. You know, they never considered whether God is fair or not. They just, it's a love that they got for God. They, what he means, not fair. So that's how infiltration works. Right. And so he stated, you know, with the, like the children, you would have to infiltrate. Right. Yeah. Uh, I, I'll come back to you. Uh, the, and the point I'm making here is in the great scheme of things, in the great controversy, right. Satan considers his number one enemy. In this, you know, like Israel considers Hamas, I guess, their number one enemy, right? They have other enemies, maybe, other little enemies. But for them, Hamas is the big one. To the, to the devil, the Seventh day Adventists here, they are the big one. Yeah, well, uh, we have to remember what the Bible says about history. The thing that has been, it is that which shall be. You know, history repeats itself, what that verse is talking about. And, and uh, Veronica mentioned the infiltration. They're using the same tactics they, that constantly use. When Christianity was, was pure, what he did was he took paganism and he mixed it with Christianity. Yeah. That's the same thing that's happening now. They're taking their mi mixed up religion, which is a mixture of paganism and Christianity. And we've seen that has infiltrated into our church. We see it in music, we see it in the standards falling on sort of thing. And why is that important? Because uh, you, you made a statement earlier that because we keep the Sabbath, you can't be deceived. Well, if you mix it up such that people don't know what they believe, really, and, and they don't. They don't, uh, they're not educated on what they right. have in the church, what we stand for, what we teach, then they don't know. Then they can't see. Yes. That, that's what we have a lot of, because you know, we have this, this mixture, this infiltration in the church, and the standards are just, you, you know, you go to some certain churches, you, you don't see any evidence of, uh, strong evidence of Adventism as we know it. Exactly. It's because it's the same tactic. That yeah. Constantine used, and it worked quite well. Mm -hmm. When he mixed it, it changed Christianity completely. And you see the same things happen to our church. Our church is changing in so many different ways. But what we have to remember is this: mm -hmm. the Bible says that God is always going to have a remnant. And and Sister White says the church is going to seem like it's going to fall, but it's not going to fall. Mm -hmm. so God's always going to have a people. So what we have to do is we have to make sure that we remain grounded in the scripture with prayer so that we are not deceived so that there are others who are deceived so that we can we can educate them and, and bring some knowledge to the ignorant because this I remember I was this was about uh, four or five years ago a young lady who was in the church had been in church all her life and I brought up to her the 2300 days and she had met she told me she had never heard of that before she had been in the church for years and that that was the first time I realized that I had not seen a seminar in our church on 2,800 days in years. It, it, it was, I was at Cap City, Cap City then. And I understood why she hadn't heard of it before, because it hasn't been preached there. So you see what's happening here is, is some of these, these core doctrines that we have been taught that are so crucial to our message are not being taught. And so the people are in ignorance. When you're in ignorance, you can be deceived. Right. You know, talking, going along with what you were saying, brother, on the... Uh, safety being the Adventist and following the truth. We, when we were in Michigan, we were members of a church in Michigan, and this mother had a daughter 
daughter's name was Casey. Do you think that's the mic? I don't hear it. You can't hear it? Yeah. You can't hear it? You, you need the mic? No, I can't. Oh, okay. All right, okay. This daughter, she had a, uh, this mother had a daughter named Casey, and she was in her 20s, and she had practiced witchcraft. And uh, she'd come to church, and she'd sit out in the vehicle and read her books on witchcraft. And anyway, the mother said uh, that her daughter... She said she could see demons, and she believed her angels. She called them evil angels or angels. She could see these angels, which were demons, and she believed in them because she could see them. And she couldn't see God, but she could see these angels. So she you know that was real. That's why she believed in witches and things like that. But here's the interesting part. She said to her mother one day, I can see an angel right beside me now as a demon. And she said, well, what I see around Seventh-day Adventist, this girl that's into witchcraft, she says, there's a blue light around me. There's a blue light of protection around all the seven heavens. Will those angels of God penetrate that? And what does blue stand for? The law. Law. The law. There you go. And, and so here you're getting it right from someone who practices witchcraft. Right. Exactly. The rocks, we well, that, that's exactly like what Roger, Roger Mano learned more and learned quite a bit about Seventh Day Adventists from that side first. That's why that kind of developed when he made he met a Seventh Day Adventist. He was so curious, he wanted to know so much because it was like, this this is where the power is. And he started uh, 28 lessons in four days. Mm -hmm. all, the le all the fundamentals, he started them in four days because that's how hungry he had become because he was amazed that, well, these are the people that the, the demons were talking about. <laughs> so, I want to know them. Yeah. Well, anyway, so that, that that's how, uh, the, the, the progressed. So Christ raised the second Advent movement in 1844 to fully clarify all the misconceptions that were being advanced uh, uh, through the Catholic through Catholicism and apostate Protestantism, because the, you know they were the Protestants they were not going all the way. They became apostate because they they were refusing to accept more truth. They were not protesting anymore. Yes. And so, through them, God designed to finish the doctrinal and spiritual reformation began by Protestant reformers of the 16th century. Now, Doctor, who, who knows what? What is the Alpha? Now, the, I mean, we now okay. We have the Seventh Day Adventist Church. We have the Ellen, Ellen White and all of that. Uh, what? Who knows what? What is the Alpha? Anybody ever heard about the Alpha? Kellogg, the Alpha, the Alpha Rebellion, I'm sorry. Pantheism, Kellogg, that movement was the beginning. Yes, yes. And it's going to end something similar to that, the uh, Omega. Now, with Kellogg, actually, Dr. Kellogg, he was a, a, a physician, I think, I believe. Oh, okay. when, when he started out, he was actually a very, very man. He was a man of God. People from all over the world came there. That was the place to go. Of all yes. the places, that was at Kellogg's. Oh, you know, not all the presidents. Yeah. You know, uh, they, I think uh, I think I remember who was at the time. They were presidents of the uh, uh, yes. world leaders yeah. went there. Anyone that was anyone. Uh, Battle Creek. Anyone that was anyone that had a health problem went there. They were, That's, right. the That's how famous he was. Is that amazing? Yeah. yeah. He had all this light, and yet he fell. The whole Kellogg's cornflake hit. Oh, by the way. We have the conflicts. Do you know who, who invented the conflicts, right? Yeah, Kellogg. It was him. Kellogg. Today you have whole series, whole aisles. By the way, unfortunately, they're not so healthy anymore. They're not. Sugar. Oh, they, they put so much sugar. I remember when, when I was little, you would buy conflicts. You would have to add sugar. Yeah. You know, now, you, now you there's so much sugar, you can't eat them anymore. Right? It's just like automatic. But I remember we, I used to love conflicts when I was coming up, you know, and, and they were nice. They were cutting edge for the mm -hmm. time. Right. And uh, I had a, a, like an amazing fact thing about those conflicts, but it, it's escaped my mind. So, but in any case, there was a fire at Battle Creek. Uh, who, who remembers the, the, the great fire that took place? Now, I, I understand, I heard that uh, 
I think Pastor Tunde preached a sermon about concentration of salt. He, he mentioned the fact that, that, that the fire was caused by the fact that they didn't want to scatter. They wanted to, they wanted to gather there at the Battle Creek. It was much like Loma Linda is today. Right. So God had to send that fire because they, did, they didn't want to go spread the word. God, God wanted them to spread so that they can share the gospel of God, but they wanted to be together. But in any case, when the fire came, they, they, it was suggested to Kellogg to write a book about health and all of that so that they could sell the book and then raise uh, from the proceeds of the sale to, to, you know, to rebuild, right? And that's where Kellogg wrote that book, uh, The Living Temple. Yes. Yes. It, it, as a matter of fact, I'm glad you reminded me there. You know that he went from being a man of God, I see, I see you, uh, Gerald, being a man of God to speaking with Satan directly. Man. He, Ellen White, there's a, there's a book, there's a book of some, uh, uh, where uh, 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 Kellogg was seen walking the grounds of Battle Creek with a young man, very handsome young man, and Ellen White said that was Satan himself. I guess he was giving him instructions or whatever it was. Uh, who, who's, who's heard about that? I've heard of it. Yeah. So can you imagine from walking with God to walking with Satan? Yeah. Brother Gerald. You know, that's, and that, com that comes when when it comes down to your own pride. You know, he was a, first of all, he was a very talented doctor, very knowledgeable, very brilliant man. And, and he didn't want that glory. And he didn't want that power. He didn't want that recognition. And it, it's it's the same thing that happened in heaven. He was just following a secret example, you know. <laughs> he was lifted up because of his, his knowledge. <clears throat> just like Satan was lifted up because of his beauty. But Sister White said, <clears throat> she described the scene where he saw Dr. Kellogg, and he was surrounded by demons. And it, it, they were in camaraderie. They were talking. And they were talking back and forth. And that, that's a far cry from, from where he was, because as Darlene said, he did, she did mentor him, and he did listen to her in the very beginning. So how does someone go from that to this? The only way that can happen is personal pride. When you reject, when you reject uh, Christ, there's only, there's only two ways you can go. <laughs> Either you're with God or you're against Him. You can't stay in between. Uh, he was with God in the beginning. Just like Saul was with God. Saul, Saul was converted in the very beginning. Right. He was converted king. Uh, he worshipped God. The whole nation worshipped God. And then what happened? When, when pride gets in there, and you choose to go that way, no. then, then the devil takes you over. And in the end time, we will see more of a manifestation of folks going one way or the other. See, now, now we get this lukewarmness and we can deal with folks that way. But, but after a while, we won't be able to, it won't be like that. You're going to have two groups, one group on the side of God and the other group on the side of the devil. And the group on the side of the devil will try to kill you. That's the evil group. And, and uh, that distinction is becoming clearer and clearer as time passes. And that's what happened to come out. When you let self get in there, and you don't give it all to God, and you, you hold on to your pride, you're going to end up talking to the devil. I think, yes, because of his success, yes. he became elevated in that's right. he, It's the same spirit of the devil, because who made the devil? Who created him? Uh, God, God created him. God created Lucifer. God created Lucifer. The devil created himself. The devil created, the devil. Yeah. The devil created himself. <laughs> true. But who yeah. created Lucifer, right? Yeah. Yeah. Lucifer true. was made by God. And he thought, he, he, he thought he, he was, it was all about him. Yeah. And uh, somebody said, well, he was walking around one day, and he passed by a mirror. 
and he said, whoa. <laughs> and, uh, and then he started looking how beautiful he was, you know. I look good. I yeah, look good, you know. And, and before you know it, he was, it was all about him. In, inside, he became puffed up, you know. Lifted up because of his youth. Now with Kellogg, I think the same thing happened with Kellogg. Yeah. With, like I said, they were movie stars. Famous people were going there. That's right. That has heads of state. Yeah. And, and who was Ellen White? Uh -huh. To her, to him, all third, of a sudden, who is this? Right? Who, can, who can she tell me? So that's what happened to him. But Satan ended up winning him over yes, he did. completely. He and by the way, actually, I heard that that conflict thing it was actually Ellen White's idea. I, I heard from, he, he got it from Ellen White. To do whatever he was doing to make those uh, flakes. flakes yeah, to make those flakes. So it was a, we saw a program, and I mean, we were just like, what? They mentioned Kellogg, and it was a, I can't think where they're trying to make one race yeah, uh, he like with that. Hitler and all that, yeah. but here in the United States, they were doing it too. Yeah. It starts with an E. You became a part of that. He, he actually was eugenics. involved with that. He it's went to eugenics. the programs yeah. for eugenics. a while. Yeah. And yeah, caught up into that. Yep. Yeah, he eugenics, bought into that as well. Eugenics. Yeah, so, yeah, eugenics. Yeah, eugenics. I can interject some of that. Yeah, yeah. Sure, go ahead. Um, they have a cereal box now, Kellogg's does, that I took a picture of a couple of years ago, and I brought it to church and showed everyone. But it says, cereal's not for gender or sex. It's cereal's for everyone. So, you know, biblically, for when they say peace and safety, sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman and child, right? So they're going, this whole thing just happens over and over again. You know, just like Gerald was saying, history repeating itself. But when they bring in everything, the ecumenical movement, you know, in, in the end, there's only two churches, right? right? The remnant and Babylon, right? right? We know Babylon is the Roman Catholic Church, but the remnant isn't necessarily Seventh-day Adventist, right? right? Because that's there's a remnant true. is everywhere, that's right? True. And that's how you know we're different than Babylon, because we don't say, well, our church is better than everybody, and if you don't, oh, that's, yeah, that's the cereal. The they, they put all the cereals together, all the Kellogg cereals together, yeah. and it's for unity. Oh, really? And, and, and you know, so they, they put it all together. So, yeah. But that ecumenical movement, that Babylon, you know, taking in everything is a, is a problem, you know, but. So, uh, in fact, Pastor General said something here which I forgot to follow up on. He said that God will always have a remnant. Yep. We know that the, the, the reason the reason we are here yeah. is so that we know how we can become part of that remnant. That is true. God will always have his, will have his remnant. The question, are you going to be part of it? You and me, are we going to be part of it? And that, the reason why God is having, giving us opportunities like these is so that we can learn to be part of that remnant. God doesn't need us. We need Him. That's right. But God loves us. He wants us to be part of the success. He wants us to be part of the victory. So, there are people that are going to be lost, but it shouldn't be one of us. That's, that's the bottom line. God wants us, every person here, to be part of that remnant. And so, we see that Satan is going to bring in these, all these heresies. And one of the things I want us to talk about now, because you know we're running out of time, we're about ten minutes. Uh, what are the heresies of the brought in by the Living Temple in this SDA church? Yes, well, Gerald. The main, the main heresy, and this is things that sort of turn off this is uh, pantheism. You know that God is in everything. That's the main thing. And if you, and that really uh, kind of seeds, that kind of seeds spiritual formation, and and you know you can just go from there. When you start, Sister White says one of the most dangerous things we can do is is start trying to define the, which she's described as the, the personality of God. You know, trying to define him, trying to com confine him to to a place where we can actually understand him. Uh, so he will obviously. And so I think this is why it addresses that in that book, uh, how Satan directed him, you know, gave him that idea. Uh, how he came up with the idea about God being in everything. 
uh, and, and that's that sees you know the new, the new age you know that you are a god he's in you you you're a god you know as, as a new age so that just leads to so much and it leads to uh the uh what's the the why should saying you know do with thy will do, do whatever you know do with whatever you want because you're a god now you're a god you can do whatever you want <laughs> You know, I think uh, I'm gonna say I'm gonna say this with a explanation. So Sunday sacredness, we don't have to necessarily be worshiping on Sunday to be worshiping to have a Sunday worship. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Because of the practices that go on in the church are the same as the Sunday sacredness, then are we not doing the same thing? You know, we got all the drums and the guitars and the, you know, the, what was that guy, that Russian guy uh, that we went to see drum? What was he, uh, that electric guitar, he's playing that jazz over at Glendale? Rock. That, that rock and roll? Yeah, rock. Yeah, that was a youth, like gospel uh, rock. Yeah, that was a youth uh, rally. Yeah, they gospel did. rock, and we got homosexuals leading the the youth groups with earrings and mm. all this carrying on. I mean, we're at Glendale. Oh yeah, Glendale. Oh, yeah. 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 That was years ago. Yeah, yeah. yeah. that wasn't even recent. Yeah. It was in the he was You know, uh, all of this stuff that's going on in the churches. We're letting our guards down, and we're. We're and Satan's just walking in there mm -hmm. and we're blind here, we don't even see him. We're like, oh that's nice, you know, we're indulging. If the heart and the foundation is of the same language, then it don't matter what they do. I mean it matters, but it don't matter what they're doing it. It's still the heart is wrong. Does, am I making sense? Does it make sense? Yeah, yeah. You know what I'm saying? So when you say Sunday sacredness, it's deeper than just Definitely. going to church on Sunday. Right. It's definitely part of it. Now, so we see that the, these are heresies that come. Now you see, the devil is very, is very clever. He brings in a root, what I would call a root heresy, from which are born other heresies. So he's very strategic because he plants, he plants something that's gonna be like a tree that's gonna rise up, you know. Uh, the parable of the tares. Remember the parable of the tares. Jesus says that you, planted right the farmer planted and planted the good the wheat and then all of a sudden before you know it the wheat is growing with the tares yeah and uh, says, where did the tares come from because an enemy did this it says yeah. the enemy planted the tares so god satan's job is to plant tares in god's church which means that in God's church, there is going to be tears until, until when? Until the harvest, until the separation, right? Are, are we, is it our job to remove the tears? No. Right? Because we can't remove the other ones. What happens if you try to remove the tears? You can't the wheat You the wheat also. That's what he says we have. What did Jesus say? Let them grow together. Them grow together. But it's good to make a distinction. There's a difference between a tear and a thistle patch. Yeah. <laughs> but what I'm saying is there are some things that do have to be dealt with where we just don't let it go. Oh, yes. If the elder yes, 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 is cheating yes. on his wife and all the other stuff going on, that has to be dealt with. Yeah, he got That's it. not what she's talking about. Right. She says let the wheat tears go together. Right. There's more subtle things going on. Yeah. There's a person that is... I'm putting money suit. So you don't know what's going on here, right? I, I could be plotting all kinds of things against the church. You wouldn't know. And you could, you can't even, you're not even supposed to try to guess at that. 
you are supposed to just let it grow with the weeds. Because in the end, when they are grown, it's only when they are grown that's when you can tell this is the wheat, this because is the tail. If you rob a bank, you're arrested for robbing a bank, that's different. Right. Yeah. <laughs> well, the, well, the reason why you cannot separate them, the, the reason why you don't separate them when they are small, when they are little, because you can't tell the difference. You can't tell who's the tail they're, until they are fully, when they are fully grown, that's when you can tell. Then they are safe to remove. Right? Even but even then, it's not you, it's not us. It's the angel that's going to remove them. Uh, wait a minute. Uh, uh, okay, I'll go, I'll go around like this. I didn't see your hand at first. Okay. What does it mean by fully grown tear? What does that mean? Brother Keen, you want to go with that? She's asking, what does it mean to be a, a fully grown tear? I think when that tear comes to fruition where everybody can see it. Yeah, it's, it's, it's very clear, yeah. it's yeah. right. There's no doubt about it anymore, but that's a tear. Yeah. That's a weed, that's, it's not something that we have problems distinguishing. Well, For let's example. Let's say they turn away from the church and start preaching Sunday and yeah. Adventists of the call, that's, that's. Right, for, for example, uh, you, you see me, right? You say, okay, bro, brother Kenny, okay. Then one day I come in here and I'm wearing the, the robes, the Roman Catholic robes, and I have a, a collar that, you know, and all of that stuff, and I'm wearing all that. Then you know that now I'm fully grown. I'm now revealing my, my full color. Father Kenny. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm now, I'm now a Bishop Kenny. <laughs> right? I'm now Bishop Kenny, and uh, I'm now uh, the priest. So, in other, in other words, the colors are fully blown, they are fully showing now. There's no question that this person is this. Right. But right now, nobody knows. So, that, that, that's, 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 does that help? that you yourself are any smarter than the other person. That means the Holy Spirit has is specially on you. He's the one who's opening these people's eyes on these things. And I'm sure everyone will attest to the same things. That look, I realize this thing. You know, you know part of the, when, when I accepted the Seventh Day Adventist message, I found out that I was able to know things even before I could read them. I remember one time I was debating with somebody about the, the Adventist church. And I was saying things which I read about later. Like for instance, the, 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 church, the Sunday was by the, the Roman Catholic church. I didn't even know, but I was saying it. You see what I mean? Because the Holy Spirit was at that point upon me revealing these things in my mind to the point that I ended up saying things that later on I said, what? How did I know this? And then I later on, I'm in a seminar, a revelation seminar. And I said, yeah, that's what I say. You know, but, I, but I'm reading about it for the first time. And a, a, another one, you know Elder Aquila Crawford? It's a yeah, friend of mine. I, I know. And Aquila, I, know, I think yeah. we all know him. Know. We used to go to his house to, but to do Bible study. And I remember <laughs> at the time, you would start to talk about something and he, and he would say, oh, wait a minute, 
what you just say, and he'll go to the book, Ellen White, and he'll be, the quotation will be there. So what I'm saying is, these things we must give God the glory because he's the one, because you might think, oh man, I'm so smart, you know, I'm so, no, no, no. <laughs> you know, God has given, given granted us this special privilege yeah. of knowing these things, of being able to see, of being able not to be deceived. That's why it's, it's not possible for, for us to be deceived as long as we are. We, if we leave the state that we are, we will be deceived. But if we remain faithful and we don't remain stationary, but we keep advancing in truth, we learn deeper and deeper things, we cannot be deceived. And General, what, what, what was the story about back yoga? <coughs> oh, yeah, well. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Okay. It's just a matter. Okay. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I've been calling all these days that I don't know what I'm doing now. <laughs> Um, for example, my neighbor, I spend um, a magazine around my neighbor by mail. Doesn't have my name, just have the address, say dear neighbor, and in the top I put this the 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 stamp of amazing amazing facts mm -hmm. because the magazine was for amazing facts. Mm -hmm. So he wrote me back that gentleman. He don't know. I don't know how he know. There was me that sent all that from a hundred houses that is in my neighborhood. He was the only one who wrote me back yeah. with my address, not my name, but with my address. Or he asked the post, the postman who sent all those stuff. Or, or I don't know how he know. Or he know I'm a Seventh Day Adventist. But this is the thing. People know you are Seventh Day Adventist because they see you going to church every Sabbath. They see you maybe dress different, you act different, you speak different, you know? But they don't know if you are jealous, if you envy, if you covet, you know? None of that stuff because that is in your heart. So that's why we have to grow together. And then Jesus know you have that in your heart. Mm -hmm. That's why he's the only one who can divide. Yeah, separate. That's separate everything. Jesus is the one who knows the heart. The end. Yeah. Yes. He knows the heart. He we knows. just see from here over there. Mm -hmm. But he's the all the way deep inside. Mm -hmm. All right. Gary. Right. Okay. Uh, well, my, my story was, um, I think I was, uh, I was about six months old. I started school when I was five. And my mother sent me to a Holy Angels, a Catholic school. Um, it was, you know, like any other school, you come through the doors, and I come through the doors, and I went to, the, to, to my class. And when I went to class, it was just dark. And I thought, I mean, it was sunny outside, but the classroom was dark. And I think I went there for about five days. And I went and I told my mother, Mike, keep this in mind, this is a 16-month-old child now. I had just turned five in June. Um, I told my mother, you need to give me, I need you to get me out of this school. I don't know what's wrong with this school. I, I, I don't want to go here no more. Just get me somewhere else. This, this, this is not the place. I, it's, I don't like this place. I was in Cap. As a matter of fact, it was right across the street from a hospital. It was Holy Angels in Gary, Indiana. Um, then my I don't know. I had to be around eight or nine, something like that. And I always wondered, what if what if Sunday wasn't really the, the really the right day to go to church? And I don't know where it came from. I couldn't tell you. I have the slightest idea. I was like, what if we found out it was supposed to be like on the Wednesday or something? And that this is this was just the thoughts that were going through my mind as a child. So when it came around that I figured that I was, you know, somebody was giving me some more oh no, here's another two more information. I was on my I was doing my urban pharmaceutical businessman rendition. Um and I was outside from 9, 10, 11, 11, 59, 12. I'm like, wait, nothing changed. Hmm. There's nothing changed 
it still is dark as it was at 10 o'clock. It's now 12.01, and it's 1 o'clock. And like, so, and nothing changed with people's minds. It ain't, didn't no daylight come at 11.59, but that's what, every year we tested on it. It's called New Year's. Four, three, two, how many are still to see? These many. That they don't change. The only thing changes is somebody's mind, the, a figment of your imagination. These are like, mm, wow. Like how we, what I've, what I've been able to see is just like how the entire world has been deceived so right. easily. Just Amen. Like, the, the entire world is under deception. And it's our job to go out and try to, one person at a time, perhaps, to undeceive. That's why when we give out the great controversy, the prayer is that the person reads and their eyes are open as many as possible. That's, that's, that's our job. We are working with Christ. So Christ is desperate to get the world undeceived, if that's a word. And he's, used, he's working and he, he said he's inviting us, giving us the privilege to work. The reason why he's having us work with him or giving us the privilege so that we can share in the reward. See, when the kingdom comes, we're going to be share, we're going to be called, we're going to be sit on the throne. Do you know that? You're going to sit with Christ. You cannot have that right to sit on the throne if you didn't. Do you know what I mean? So God is giving us right now the opportunity to be part of those that will sit on the throne because we were co-laborers with him from door to door, one person at a time, one person sharing here. If that person's eyes are open, praise the Lord, the angels in heaven rejoice. One person, that's how God is going to uh, finish this work. One through his people, through us. He could have sent angels to do the job, but he wants us also to have a part because the reward is for, the, for us to get the reward. All right, so I'm going to take the last two comments and then I'm going to give the closing remarks. Yeah. Brother Keen and then Sister Gurley. And what you said, you know, Satan, Satan knows that. He knows it. We have the potential to pretty much fill his spot in heaven or something close to that. And so. We're all targets, and that shouldn't make us paranoid, but it should take, cause us to take him seriously. We're all targets, and the more influence we have in giving the message, the more we're targeted. That's why Kellogg, was well, it's not the excuse, but Kellogg went down because Satan put a lot of effort into taking him down because he was doing a wonderful work for God, a wonderful work. And Satan targeted him. He targeted King David, took him down. David came back, but still, look at the damage. And so as we become faithful, more faithful to God, we should expect that somebody's on our trail. Yes. And, and not to and take that And he doesn't give up. He yeah. doesn't give up. Until we go to the grave. First, he's going to be dogging us all the way. Sister Gurley. Yes. So to add to this, to come to this, being a woman, she's going to be dogging So here is the thing, Satan wants to destroy truth. Through these heresies that he introduces, his goal, because truth is what opens people's eyes. People are deceived because there's no truth. What's the opposite of truth? Lies, right? Deception. So Satan, now one of the, tr the biggest one that he has taken out, through the year, uh, I'm going to have someone, uh, you, you all have phones, right? Yeah. Now, I'm just skipping forward now to Vatican II, just one, one point on Vatican II. We don't have time to, to discuss that one. Hebrews, go to Hebrews. This is what Vatican II brought us through this uh, deception. 
uh, Hebrews 9, verse 12. Someone uh, read that in King James Version, and then I want someone to read it in NIV. Neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. What version is that? It's King James. Okay, can you read that in, uh, in NIV? You don't have... Which, which verse is again? Hebrews 1? Hebrews 9, 9 verse 12. 12. 9, 12. All right. Yes. What's the difference here? Oh, that's all wrong. Holy What's most, wrong with it? Holy, most holy. Uh, you know, with this verse, the entire seven-day Adventist is destroyed. With this verse, if we use if the NIV with the NIV version, seven-day Adventists have no reason to exist. Do we understand that? Does anybody not understand that? Explain myself. Yes. The, King James version, the King James Version lets you know that the reason that the, the, the blood of the goats and the, and the lambs was done away with was because of Christ. And right. then the NIV version just totally obliterates that. It. it makes it like a love and this, this is talking about the, in the sanctuary. The sanctuary. What, what is If Jesus enters the most holy place from the first resurrection, he goes straight into the most holy place. Is there in 1844? No. No, 1844. The prophecy is gone. If there's no 1844, is there an investigative judgment? No. If there's no investigative judgment, what else is not there? There's so many things, right? The entire, you see how, say, how smart say, slick Satan is? It's almost like he just. The entire Seventh Day Adventist Church down by just this. But you see, this is the official. The NIV is the official version of the uh, Sabbath School quarterly in yeah. the church. Yeah. Can you see that? It's horrible. It's horrible. I'm doing a study on Bible for virgins that I can do in the class, and it's horrible. Yeah. But I want to say this: they took away uh, for us. Okay, you see that? Yeah. He says, and then it used the word obtaining and as though it's something that can continually be done. You see, it's got I-N-G, mm. where over here it says obtain, period. Yes. E-D yes. means that's it, it's done. You can't keep doing it. But over here it says I-N-G, as though it's something you can keep doing. Right. Okay? Yeah. It's almost like Jesus is being sacrificed over and over, over and over again. Over again. That's what, that's what says, the it says he did not enter by means of blood, of the blood of goats and calves. Okay, but this is neither by blood of goats and calves. So when when you read it as though he did not enter, so that he brings him down to our level and it's not a, a divine act it's a human act when you say he you know what I mean it don't say he it says neither by those the, the whole sentence from the beginning it flows where they break it up and say he so they're pointing so that makes you take your mind to a human act and not a, a divine act amen 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 that's that's a powerful observation. And on that note, therefore, I want to also say that once you lose the sanctuary, uh, you lose everything. In fact, we have lo the Seventh-day Adventist Church has lost the sanctuary. Yeah, they have. Why do I say that? Do you know, the, remember that video that I showed you? The, the, the gyrating and the dancing? 
You know that if you have the sanctuary understanding, they all will be there. in the most yeah. holy place, you don't do that. <laughs> and uh, where, where is our high priest right now? And this is supposed to be the what? The antitypical day of atonement. And there's certain behaviors. You know, in the antitypical day of atonement, there's certain diet, there's certain music you can do play. You know, all of those things. In fact, that's why the Seventh day Adventist is the way it is. It's because of that sanctuary message. It took me a while to understand that because I didn't understand at first because I, I used to love to dance. Yeah. I think I was fairly good at it. <laughs> but, but, but here's the thing. And here's the thing. It's not, if you're in the most holy place, you don't eat certain foods. Because your, your, your high priest is in there. It's how you, your attitude towards your high priest in the most holy place, doing the investigative judgment, right now determines how you live they amen so they this is they weren't partying <laughs> it's, they it's, were. there was no party you know no revelry no gyre no no none of that because it's a serious time serious consideration that must take place in our hearts and in our minds all right i've been trying to say it's it's at the end but i see there's a, is there a pressing hand who wants, wants clothes? Is this a girl in us? Okay, all right. Yeah, I'm okay. Okay, praise the Lord. Uh, we are thankful. Let us uh, pray. <clears throat> Father in heaven, we have had a wonderful time here. We've learned so many things. We've encouraged one another. I have learned so many things from the comments that I've heard. Thank you for the opportunity and the privilege that of being here with the brethren. All that we want, Lord, is to be part of the people that will finish the work, part of the people that are called the remnant, part of the people that are sealed. And we see that there are so many things, there's so many winds of doctrines that are sweeping through the church. And the church is looking like it's about to fall. But we know that in the end, it does not. We didn't even discuss about Ganun Diab with his latest videos about ecumenism and all of that. We didn't even get to that. This was, these are the leaders of the church, the general conference, talking things like this. We know that in Ezekiel, they ended the final abomination was men turning their backs on the temple and worshiping the sun. But even there, you had people in there, Lord. Your people were inside while the abominations were going on. And that's why you had to send those angels to go and, and, and seal, to put a mark on them so that they do not face the same fate as those that are the wicked. And so we pray and plead, Lord, that we, we, even though there's all these things that may sometimes be discouraging, but help us to be encouraged because you love us and you want us to be part of the final, final remnant, the remnant of the remnant. Many might turn their backs on the church and turn and worship the Son, but help us to remain faithful and not be moved. I pray for each and every person here, Lord, this is an individual thing, that all of us may be sealed, sealed in Christ Jesus, that we may not be moved, that they may be completely settled in the truth, that we cannot be moved, though heavens may fall. Thank you, Lord, for the wonderful Sabbath afternoon and for the uh, wonderful